And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from RP Craft Publishing, and and now is developing a book all about the more unci uncivilized quote unquote races in the world in the world of D and D through the Book of Conflict, which will be hit which will be heading kick onto Kickstarter soon. The one and only Ibrahim Mohamed Selik. I hope I got it right. <laughs> How you doing today, man? Thank you very much. You almost got it. Uh, no problem. Uh, I'm fine. How are you? I'm do I'm doing all right. Oh. Okay. I'm I'm I'm. It's only it's only been a little ways into it's only been a little ways into spring, and I already missed the winter. Uh, how 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 did that happen? I'm more of a winter guy than a not. Yeah, I I get it. The heat makes people lazy, you know. You you want to sit back and relax. Don't want to move that much, but the cold makes you move, you know. Mm -hmm. Forces you to move. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's just I. You can always put on more than you can take off. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's tradition around here to. to open up with the humble beginnings. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. My first introduction to the uh, RPG games uh, were in my middle school years, like 12 or 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And some of my friends were playing AD&D 2nd Edition. Also, you know, the Baldur's Gate games, Icewind Dale, or, or uh, Neverwinter Nights, mm -hmm. etc. And uh, they wanted to include me into the tabletop part of the game, uh, instead of the uh, computer games. Mm -hmm. And I liked it so much that I uh, took some of the books from my friends and never gave it back. <laughs> So if, and, they, if they end up hearing this, we apologize in advance. Yeah, <laughs> I I lost almost all of them in the years that came. But uh, if I encounter them again in in my old years, I will buy them a lot of books for compensation. Bribery. Yeah, <laughs> it it started with a robbery, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, it, it was all uh, internet forums and friends from there and conventions. That's all uh, about my start. Mm -hmm. But with, with that in mind, yeah. um, when it comes to Book of Conflict... Um, yeah. How did this idea? How did this idea come to be? It it came to be when I read the Forgotten Realms campaign setting for third edition, and it it said like uh, this is the population of this area, excluding greenskins, you know, the goblins, orcs, whatever, because they were always uh, there to kill and. Uh, to place as much as DM wants. They were not, um, in my opinion, considered like other people, you know. Even when they are. Uh, that struck a chord with me because, uh, uh, you know, the uh, cycle of the game uh, begins in uh, playing elves, dwarves, uh, halflings, you know, and 
you you transition to evil versions of these. Then you start to play unconventional races like goblins, orcs, or if you are more courageous, you try like Gityanki or uh, elemental beings or outsiders, you know. But uh, most of the people, the second or third choice were orcs and goblinoids. And uh, I noticed a distinct lack of gameplay material and lore for these races. Everyone assumed that uh, the players and the DM knows what the orcs are, the goblins are, but uh, never bothered to write write it down in uh, in a useful way, you know. And uh, that that was uh, our starting point. Uh, the other writer, uh, Jihan, and I uh, wrote a small booklet in 2008 together uh, about this for 3.5 edition mm -hmm. uh, all, of course it, it was more uh, amateurish than this uh, this campaign it was uh, for the use of our friends and uh, community in in our uh, website uh, we wanted to try out the uh, same approach for Kickstarter mm. and try try out our ideas in a worldwide scenario, you know. And our first project should be the, the first project that we did years ago. And we started the Book of Conflict uh, project two years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's been two... And... You mentioned you mentioned the earlier attempt being a bit amateurish. The first thing that comes to mind is an, is the old adage, "The first thing you do sucks." It, it sucked a lot. <laughs> yeah. Oh. But, oh, it does. It doesn't exactly help that ar probably around that around the time of around the time that you were doing this, that was probably by the that the point that three point five was being buried in options. Yeah. The, I, I believe it, it was the time of Player's Handbook 3. Uh, the third third Player's Handbook. And it, it was like uh, extremely rich in uh, options and everything. It, it's, it's like today actually for 5th edition. There are a lot of people publishing a lot of content for the game. But but we believe that we did better this time. Mm -hmm. So, with that in with that in mind, uh, yeah. and I do I do want to give you my thanks for sent for sending me that document to preview some preview some of the material because some of it we will be go we will be going over in this. Okay. Oh. Now, as I, as, as I understand, as I understand it, it would the with a lot a lot of games when they approach when they approach the savage races, it's mostly orcs and goblins, which you you do have accounted for. But I also see that you have hobgoblins, bugbears, and and half orc variants. Yeah. Oh. And each of, each of them is going to have six variants. Yeah, I... yeah. Uh, the 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 main thing that we discovered is uh, we have a lot of options for dwarves, even gnomes that almost no people play. You know, uh, many halflings. Uh, a lot of humans uh, for settings and whatever, mm -hmm. but you only get one kind of orc, one kind of goblin. Even even though in the lore you have like uh, from from the Forgotten Realms sense, uh, sword cost goblins are different than the uh, 
uh, Sea of Dragons uh, goblins and Ch Cholt goblins, you know. Uh, but they are not represented in the mechanics and the gameplay options. Also, the orcs are different. Uh, even in uh, the Forgotten Realms setting and uh, all of the other settings. Uh, also, uh, there are different kinds of hobgoblins from setting to setting. Uh, you know, the Dragonlance hobgoblins are different than the Forgotten Realms or Greyhawk. Mm -hmm. uh, Hobgoblins. Uh, we wanted to uh, give the option to DM and the players to uh, enrich their worlds, and uh, we wanted to uh, not deny the uh, ra racial uh, position they occupy in the world. You know, uh, they are brutal. They have reasons to be brutal, but they have other options. They are. Uh, you know, out of the uh, lifestyle they they were given by their own kin and also the other races. Uh, they have uh, peaceful options. Uh, four of the uh, sub races will be uh, different variations of the uh, their traditional sense, mm -hmm. and one option will be more neutral to the uh, world. Uh, minding their own business or something, but not too different from the others uh, in in uh, lifestyle regard. Just the approach, but one of the uh, one of the sub races will be like very different from the others. Mm -hmm. Like uh, hobgoblins that follow a paladin. Uh, God, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, orcs that that try to be peaceful. Uh, for example, the neutral, uh, quote unquote, orcs are also very violent, but they they just mind their business and uh, do uh, war as a challenge rather than uh, to pillage and. Uh, destroy the civilization uh, but they are also warlike but the the outlier uh, sub race is just peaceful minding their own business healing people uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it all it, it's, it's all like that in all races six sub races yep. uh, for uh, different stats uh, strength dexterity or whatever, and their lifestyles are also different. Yeah, I also saw, and there's a bit of there's a bit of this in the preview document that you are going to be doing some ha some um, half vari some half variants. Um, given given that the ones that you had were um, j were just mixes of go of goblin and or and orc, or just a various race and orc. Um, how many half variants do you plan on putting in the book in total? Because there's a lot, there's a lot of races, and thus a lot of variants that could potentially happen. Yeah, uh, we we start with eight, but in the stretch goals we have more. Also, we have uh, other races with uh, six sub races each, like gnolls, kobolds, and lizard folk, that we think that fits the uh, context. Uh, also, each comes with the variant of the half orc uh, of the uh, corresponding race. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought of the half orc like uh, in 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 a tiefling sense. Uh, it, it should be different for for each race that uh, intermingles with the orcs because. Uh, the regular half orc is just a watered down version of the uh, regular orc. Uh, it, it's it's for the people that want to play orc but not want to go too deep in in the uh, uncivilized route. You know, mm -hmm. it, the city orc. Uh, uh, we can say about the regular half orc, but why why would 
ei, ei ork and a norm union should produce a half orc that is hulking uh, almost orc like rather than a a mix of the races uh, we wanted to explore that idea and produced a, a very different eight uh, variants of the orcs Every, each one is unique and uh, we we explained how the orcs treat them how the other half of the uh, race treats them also the uh, world outside of these two races uh, view them you know mm-hmm. we we have a lot of lore for each half orc variant and we will have more i think if all the all the uh, stretch goals are achieved it it will be like 20 that's good. that is going that is going to be quite a few, yeah. Um, and I'm now when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to um, classes, it's mentioned on the it's mentioned on the Kickstarter page that there's going to be five cl- going to be five classes, and the preview document um, went into one that being the War Chief. Yeah. Uh, the Obviously, obviously, going into each class in detail is go- is going to be a bit of an ask. But what could you tell me about the five classes in terms of their overall play style, and what and what they're going to be bringing to the table? We we designed each class to be uh, centered around uh, one unique mechanic. Uh, the pack is our proudest achievement, but it it is hard to edit and play test. So. Uh, we didn't include it in the demo booklet, but we are in the process of editing a raw version, a uh, non-playtested version of it, uh, and make it to the campaign, so we can uh, add it in the last minute. Uh, the pack is three small-sized characters played as one. Uh, they they are uh, blood-bonded to each other to survive the big world's uh, dangers and they get a fourth boss boss link leader link uh, in later levels Mm -hmm. and they they become maybe as strong as another class but you will have three of them Mm -hmm. or four of them and uh, each small uh, uh, pack link you know uh, we as we call it have different variations like one of one of them is a weaker version of a rogue and another is a weaker version of a warrior fighter uh, another is uh, just skill based or uh, something we have a lot of uh, pack links and uh, the pack the is the most unique class we designed. Mm-hmm. Then we have War Chief that you can see in the uh, demo booklet. Mm-hmm. That uh, in in our research we have found that uh, people have tried to replicate the uh, Warlord from Fourth Edition, but. Uh, they have made like a trade-off from uh, fighting in the front line. Uh, most of the commanding uh, battlefield commander uh, classes that uh, people designed lack the uh, durability of the front line and uh, lack the uh, ability to fight in the front front line. They they are just shouting in shouting from the back uh, then why is it different from the bard bard at least gets some spells and uh, other abilities that are useful outside of the combat and inside the combat Uh, why would I play someone that 
shouts commands and stays in the back. Uh, so we designed the war, war chief to be in the front line and fighting together with, with their allies and be effective both in commanding and fighting. We have Talon that is a uh, that is filling a place between a barbarian and a monk. Mm -hmm. They are the uh, survivalists that live in the harshest wilderness that eats almost anything they they find and uh, craft weapons and armor from their bones and the things they find in the wilderness. Uh, they are immune to disease and resistant to poison. Uh, and they are a dangerous foe to be uh, faced in the wilderness, you know, mm -hmm. because you will you will be depleted of the resources while they do not because they have a lot of uh, options in that regard. Uh, we have uh, we have Marauder. Marauders are a unique uh, class that I designed. They gain a momentum while they fight. Every attack gives them uh, speed and they have debilitating attacks that uh, slows down their opponents. They when they reach a certain point, they move uh, upwards in the initiative order. That's why we have the uh, initiative tracking DM screen in our campaign to keep track of the uh, initiative order because uh, one of our classes move a lot of uh, a lot in the initiative order. Uh, when they reach the topmost initiative order, they get to attack another time mm -hmm. and use some unique abilities. That uh, you can think of the Marauder like uh, the fast fighter that uh, wears down the armored knights and circles around them. If, if it does make sense. And the Ancestral Shaman is a, a spellcaster that can summon their ancestral spirits and uh, suck the soul off out of their enemies to power their spells. Uh, it, it is very flexible, the Ancestral Shaman. Mm -hmm. And you can be a great healer or you can be a, a crowd controller as uh, <laughs> in the in the game sense mm -hmm. and it i believe it it has a lot of non combat abilities as well uh, i have to check the latest uh, latest version of this class because I was busy in the marketing and uh, our, our friends designed the latest version of, of it. Uh, I'm not that familiar with the latest, latest version. Uh, the general sense is they have soul magic. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the one of the bigger... Um contributions that is that is going to be present is the concept of the pack yeah um, how is how is the pack mechanic going to work going going to um work it work in context is it a case where they're controlling three characters with one initiative is it a is it a case where that where um where it's just where it's just the get the gag of th of um of three three kobolds in a trench coat, although that's probably not <laughs> off the table. Um, how how is it? How would it work out in in combat? And how would you make sure it doesn't it doesn't get too crunchy for players? Yeah, it is it is a very 
a distinct challenge in that regard. Uh, the three kobolds in a trench coat is not off the table. It it is doable in in the sense of the class. Uh, also, I believe we have a sidebar that if you want to play that way, you can uh, play it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if you separate them in in a small area, they will be more effective. Uh, they share the initiative. Also, uh, I think we, we, we will provide a customized character sheet to help people uh, play it very easily because uh, it, it is for the people that like the crunch it it is not for the newcomers you know uh, it is it is a high concept class that needs a lot of familiarity with the rules and to the extent that a uh, breaking them does not fry your brain mm -hmm. but uh, newcomers will struggle it struggle with it for sure it it will need a lot of uh, play testing yeah uh, we are sure of that yeah it's i remember i remember playing heroes of the storm and it ha and it having the lost vikings where you have one person where you have um three where you have um three Vikings on the f on the field at once, and yeah. that was a that was a very tricky and weird situation to deal with, which is the main re the main reason why I ask when it comes to the pack because I could see that kind of thing, um happening. Yes, in the earlier earlier versions of it, uh, as we played it, were very slow in movement mm -hmm. uh, because they they share. HP pools and speed pools and uh, they divided between them and they were not reaching anywhere and they were uh, falling prey to the ranged attacks because of it because of that mm -hmm. uh, we tried to fix it but uh, once you have pools of something uh, it, it opens the door to the exploitation of the uh, of the pool you know it, because if you if you give them 90 feet movement pool uh, someone can uh, use it all with one character and reach unreachable places that you never expected you know uh, so we we have play tested it a little bit and try to make the mathematics work but uh, it will take a lot of time but we are sure it is almost complete mm. uh, we, are, we, we will be trying to make it uh, easier that that's all I can say about it uh, it will be a challenge for sure So, with that in with that in mind, yeah. Oh, I did see that you are planning on putting a f on putting a few subclasses for the core classes. Um, yeah. What can you t What can you tell me about what those are gonna a What those are gonna be adding? Uh, let me see. Uh, the subclasses are uh, for all all of the races to be used not just brutal races but their uh, origin origins in in the lore uh, are from the brutal races like phalanx warriors could be from dwarves or hobgoblins because they they use a lot of phalanx formation mostly uh, it, it, its earlier versions were hobgoblin phalanx fighter mm -hmm. uh, because it, it was their style of phalanx rather than the dwarf phalanx but uh, we changed it to include more races more cultures uh, the menacing warrior is men menacing stalker is uh, a fear-based ranger that 
uses uh, intimidation tactics and the traps to uh, make their enemies give up before they even fight. Mm -hmm. uh, the others are like that. Also, the smuggler, the rogue uh, subclass that is like... You know, the slums have a lot of brutal race people living in uh, sewers or poor districts and they smuggle a lot of contraband into or people into the cities uh, if, even if they live in the city they do not cooperate with the civilization uh, that can be used by the other races there can be a human smuggler or an elf smuggler uh, it is used for uh, hiding people or items and moving them a lot of places you know mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we were doing it like uh, they are originating from the brutal races but it is not a far fetch to include the other races it, it is a mix in between. The, the uh, sub races are like that. Yeah. And I, and um, one that I so, one that I was curious about is the um do is the Doombringer. It it changed a lot because the originally it its name was Gutter Rager. Like. A, a poisonous uh, area of them area of effect barbarian that lived in the sewers or the swamps mm -hmm. the poisonous swamps and uh, came out in rage and a debilitating cloud of uh, uh, toxicity you know but uh, there is a subclass of druid that uh, almost did the same things so we changed it to be uh, more destructive and change the lore the doombringer in the latest version is a, a heavy hitter that uh, also uses necromantic uh, abilities they learned from the uh, subclass of the war chief mm -hmm. the red lord and the ancest ancestral shamans' uh, soul sucking abilities. They they use a version of that for their rage. They imbue themselves in necrotic energies. Uh, the, there were not a necrotic variant of the barbarian in any book. We wanted to fill that void, so it worked out in the end. And when, now, with that with that in mind, one of the other big mechanical entries is Uncanny Grub. <laughs> yeah, oh. it, it it is a it is a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the brutal races get defeated a lot and chased away from the periphery of the civilization to the extreme wilds, and also they tend to live in uh, ruins, magical ruins, or uh, toxic swamps, or uh, underground where there is little food that they, they have to eat anything they find. So they, they find, found out that eating some disgusting things, some dangerous things, that other races wouldn't even dream of touching gave them some abilities that uh, that are risky because th there is always a risk of death and disease and disability uh, using these foods but if you use them the right way you can gain some unexpected powers you know mm -hmm. from a magic ma from the maggots that 
uh, infest the corpse of a magical beast. Uh, if you eat them, you gain the magical powers of that beast, for example. Or, uh, you know, the when, when the uh, heroes kill the dragon in a in a legendary way and loot the uh, caverns of that dragon, leave leave the uh, corpse behind. It it becomes a, a place of like legend, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, the surviving uh, surviving minions of that dragon can uh, go back and eat that dragon because they have nothing left, and find out that the heroic last hit that slayed that dragon uh, imbued the flesh with the heroic powers of the uh, of the uh, you know the dragon slayer mm -hmm. and they gain power from that they could have found that in in their desperation to survive mm -hmm. uh, it is a one of the legendary uncanny grab and also the also the uh, toxic uh, Toxic fungi that grows in the underdark or the uh, dangerous caverns are are a common food for the brutal races, mm -hmm. and they can kill you or give you some strange power. That that is the uncanny grab. Mm -hmm. And I'm get I is it again? Is it going to be a case where? Where there, where there's a series of set effects, or would it be, or would it be a case where people would, would be able to kind of, kind of mix and match to create to create different effects based on the environment? We we will give some examples, uh, about twenty examples of the different uncanny grab, but we will give some tables to uh, create your own effects and uh, disadvantages. Also, we will give some inspiration to the DMs to uh, try out different things. Maybe we can include some uh, free PDFs that we uh, create in in the meantime. The discarded uh, ideas that we didn't use in the book, maybe. Uh, th there will be a lot of the uncanny grab in the book and also in our uh, social medias or website maybe yeah and well if you if you look throughout human history there's plenty of strange and interesting foods that can be used as a template yes of course um and along along with along with some of the well, just in the states, I can think I can think of a few foods that would fit that'd probably be a little bit too spicy for some. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. You you can you can burn your stomach or get a lot of enjoyment and a good day out of a meal. Because mm -hmm. while well, some while well, somebody unironically likes gumbo somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just I'm just using that as as one as one potential example, but there but there's pl there's plenty that can there's plenty that can be uh, thought that can be thought up. Yeah, uh, of course. I I just I just lean towards the towards the spicy end or the spicy end of things because um of a bet of a infamous experience with the Carolina Reaper. Yeah, but the other one of the other elements I wanted to cover was superstitious magic. I'm guessing, I'm guessing that is to make it so that magic is not is not so much of a science as it as it is in core. Yeah, uh, superstitious magic is uh, the civilized races have access to each other's magic. Uh, human humans can buy uh, dwarven magical items or get blessings from 
uh, elven monarchs, you know, like Galadriel gave out uh, shining lights or magical items to the uh, uh, ring carriers, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but the brutal races don't have that luxury because they they always uh, defeat themselves, uh, quote unquote, because if if the humans or elves don't defeat them, they defeat each other and uh, tear down their own civilization a lot more. So they, they don't have that much tradition in magic. They don't have a lot of uh, deities of magic. Uh, they don't trust the magic that much. So uh, superstitious magic comes out from the goblins because you know the goblin a chief that uh, declares the stick they hold is uh, a magical stick from God and they have the authority of their God in, in their hands and they are uh, the chief now and when someone else gets that same stick they are the chief now and they, are, they have the blessing of the God and the uh, old, old chief must uh, must obey them or something the or or uh, the dream catchers or something like uh, random things that may or may not work magically outside of the tradition and academy of the magic uh, because you know the even the sorcerers and warlocks uh, channel their magic from uh, similar sources not from uh, the uh, random randomness of the uh, even even the wild sorcerers uh, draw the wild magic from the uh, unexpected corners of the same source you know mm -hmm. uh, the superstitious magic is like you can you can declare that something is magical but it may not but sometimes it can draw the attention of a being that throws in a little little bit of magic to uh, nudge you in in a way that benefits them mm -hmm. maybe you have stumbled upon a partial spell or a forgotten relic, you know, maybe. Or or your god has granted something in intervention. Uh, it, it is totally random and depends on the... Uh, maybe the entity that grants that magic or the circumstances that grant that magic. So it is unreliable, but... Uh, Something, something that is uh, how to how to say it, not harmful to try, mm -hmm. you know. This isn't say wild magic in this. <laughs> no, not wild magic. It is more unpredictable than the wild magic. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on also the uh, persuasion of the item or the concept that is used in superstition uh, by the others because uh, you know the example of the leadership stick if if they if they are not part of your tribe the leadership stick won't work on them mm -hmm. like that uh, there are limitations a lot of limitations but it is an extra source of power there, there is no harm in trying that. We, we also wanted to make it different from the uh, uncanny grab because uh, if if we only gave buffs uh, like ben only benefits in uncanny grab and uh, the superstitious magic and uh, didn't differentiate it a lot of uh, a, a lot, uh, it it will it it would be uh, overpowered and. It, it would be a power creep, you know. Mm -hmm. We we wanted to have uh, downsides, but not just uh, debuffs, not just penalties. 
maybe just it it not working as intended is a penalty enough, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can, I can cer- I can certainly get behind that. Now, the uh, now um, with that with that in mind, with the comp- with since the blood hunt is also put in as a world building mechanic, how exactly is that going to work? Most of the most of the content we are uh, providing are geared towards the players, you know, and we wanted to include something for the DMs because uh, being a party of elves, dwarves, humans, halflings is different from being a party of hobgoblins, orcs, whatever, you know, mm-hmm. because. Uh, you have uh, also the prejudice against you as as a successful adventuring party uh, as an enemy a, an an intangible enemy that is hampering your uh, achievements because uh, some of your kin may be jealous of your achievements and uh, would would think that you would replace them as the as the chief of the tribes or uh, maybe they are jealous of your magical items and want to take them also uh, a successful orc party may draw the attention of the elves in the area that don't want a powerful uh, adventuring party of orcs and goblins in, in near near their forests maybe that can that can be overlooked in the uh, in the game by the DMs because uh, it is hard to uh, get get a step back a few a few steps and see the world in in a wider point of view when p- players are enjoying themselves and uh, and and are pulling the strings too much you know most most of the dms uh, get focused on what the players are doing instead of the uh, what what the world are what, what the world is doing you know so we wanted to provide a an a another uh, tool in the dms toolbox to uh, make the game uh, more eccentric and more suited to the brutal races in that regard. Mm-hmm. Especially because, since, yeah. Especially since, un- unless I'm mistaken, you guys aren't aiming for a specific setting. Yeah, we, we are not. We are doing a general, general lore thing, and DMs are free, free to uh, adapt the. Uh, in the contents to their liking also we, we will have a a section in in the beginning that uh, we'll talk about this uh, some of the concepts you know of uh, war and violence in the book are not suitable to every play style uh, we, we will be telling the people that if you are not comfortable with with the lore you can skip it and just use the mechanics mm-hmm. for different things for example uh, one w- one of the people in our discord told us that the uncanny grab could be used in in a horror setting maybe that we we, we never thought of that but it, it is a good idea people can do that maybe mm-hmm. uh, an exploration uh, it, it can be used as, as an exploration mechanic, you know, uh, pe- uh, pioneers uh, go to the new world and try out different things from there and they, they risk their health to uh, discover the different food and powers from the new world, maybe. Mm-hmm. It can be used like that, not, not the not the way we intended 
per se, you know? Yeah. Now, to, yeah. Th to, to that particular end, when, um, I did see I did see the DM screen that you had in the and the numbers on the t on the top was something that I f I found interesting. What is what is that what is that exactly for? It is for uh, hanging the names of the players or the monsters that uh, corresponds to the initiative order. You know, mm -hmm. the one one is the first one in line, two is the next one, three is the next one. Mm -hmm. If if they don't use the Marauder class, they won't uh, move them up, move them too much. But uh, if if the players have ways of moving in the initiative order, they can uh, move their names in that regard. Mm -hmm. Also, we will be providing a printable uh, initiative trackers to hang hang there to face the DM side and the player side mm -hmm. and they they will have like a p bug bears that are scaling the wall or a, a prisoner that that hangs by the neck from the uh, from the battlements you know mm -hmm. like like that il illustrations of different things and and a place to write out the names of the uh, occ occupants of the of this uh, initiative order mm -hmm. yeah I can I can certainly get that now when when are you planning to when when are you planning jet um in a broad strokes at least to, to launch the Kickstarter since it's currently in the early in the early um, stages we are we are planning to release in uh, on 30th of May May in a few days. Mm -hmm. uh, we have less than one week ahead of us, and we are excited. Uh, we we think that we we have done a great job in creating the content and the items, but we will see when the community decides if if we are right or not mm -hmm. and uh, i will i will be looking forward to seeing how it how it develops thank you very much yeah but with all that said i do want to yeah. sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my show and enjoy the madness around here even if it means braving the hell that is time zones thank you very much for hosting us it is it is it can be said the same about you because it, it is early in the morning for you i think yeah thank you very much mm -hmm. what can i say you you are very kind to have us and ask us those questions it, it helps a lot in in that regard mm -hmm. thank you very much my pl my pleasure and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet but until then on behalf of the good brothers present and not present my name is mildra i am your gaming monk Stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>